I spent a few uh, false starts to this one, but I hope it will be the, the final take. Um, I hope you guys are doing okay. I'm extremely hot down here. Um, I switched out to my uh, Kolchak the Night Stalker <laughs> night shirt. I uh, just wanted to show you that. Um, so a few episodes ago, I did an unboxing uh, video on Murder in a Blue World, uh, a new Cauldron Films release uh, on Blu-ray, and uh, came with a deluxe limited slipcase, which, you know, basically just some nice artwork. Uh, and um, so as promised then, uh, I'm going to do a formal review. So that's why I'm here now. So, uh, here's the item in question, uh, Sans Slipcase. Uh, this is uh, the original poster from 1973, uh, graphic, Una Gota de Sangre para Morir Amando. Now, I am going to get this dang translation right if it kills me. A drop of blood to die loving. Uh, this film was also known in French as Le Bal du Baudou a.k.a. the Voodoo Ball. Uh, it was also known as Dead Angel in some countries and Satan's Brute in others. Uh, and it's most popularly known among uh, cult and horror film fans as Clockwork Terror. Clockwork Terror by Eloy de la Iglesia. So this is the kind of uh, current preferred title, which I do think is superior, Murder in the Blue World. Um, the bootlegs that were floating around when I first saw this around 1999 were all clockwork terror. Um, and uh, I noticed gradually over the years, uh, it became known more as Murder in a Blue World. There was kind of a, a cheap, kind of semi-authorized uh, DVD release, which I, I was going to buy, but I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I waited. So <clears throat> I've got... I guess a lot to say about this. I don't know if this will be another epic length um, diatribe, but it's been a hell of a week for me, as usual, right? Um, but uh, I wanted to thank you guys uh, because my views and likes are, are gradually rising. Uh, some of my videos are really taking off as far as views, and I appreciate so many people being interested. Um, I'll talk about all that another time, but uh, in order to keep that momentum going, I just want to ask you guys to please uh, smash the like button, the thumbs up. Uh, really helps fight the tide of algorithms. And uh, of course, you know, share if you like, subscribe if you haven't. And uh, I'll have links for that at the end. Um, and, you know, Thank you for everything. Um, I'll give some more thanks at the end. But so let's let as they say on all these true crime videos that I uh, follow. Let's get into it. So uh, Eloy De La Iglesia, you know, he's been one of my faves since the late '90s. Uh, an old friend of mine uh, turned me on to him via uh, bootleg videos, VHS. I know what else to say, bootleg. Uh, from uh, primarily from European Trash Cinema, uh, Greg Ledbetter's uh, company, uh, and that's a uh, that's an imprint that uh, my my good friend Robert Monell is is still affiliated with. Uh, he is uh, I'm not sure if he subscribed to this channel or not, but he is an uh, active uh, and valuable member of my Facebook film group called uh, Deep Images. Which you can, you're welcome to check out if you're on Facebook um, and apply for membership. Um, anyway, so Eloy, yeah, I can't remember the first one I saw. I actually think this was the first one I saw, Clockwork Terror. Uh, and to me, it was this, I guess, simplest of the of the four that I saw in that period, which also were Cannibal Man and. Um, Glass ceiling. No one heard us. Heard the spring. So uh, in nineteen, this was I guess around nineteen ninety eight, actually nineteen ninety seven, actually possibly late ninety seven, early ninety eight, because 
1998, I actually had published in Shock Cinema reviews of No One Heard the Scream and The Glass Ceiling. Um, and so those have all been favorites of mine for a while. Uh, around 2013, I upgraded uh, the print of those. Well, I'd never had them on DVD. I'd had them on VHS. I upgraded to DVD, uh, just again, bootlegs uh, through this site called iOffer.com. I don't know if it's still in existence. If it is, don't don't order. It's You get ripped off more often than not, but occasionally you actually got something rare that, you know, it was hard to find elsewhere for a decent price. But uh, I, I really had to learn my lesson with those guys. Um, uh, I also upgraded uh, both of them um, to nicer prints. I forgot what the source material was, uh, Blu-ray or DVD from another country, I'm not sure. But I upgraded Glass Ceiling and uh, No One Heard the Scream from Rarelust.com in 2019. Um, so yeah, Glass Ceiling, I'm still waiting on the Blu-ray. I reviewed Glass Ceiling several episodes back. Please check out my review of that. Uh, I talk a lot more about uh, Mr. Deli Iglesia, and yes, his son, Alex, is the guy who did uh, Action Mutant and uh, Day of the Beast and Perdita Durango and others. So, but I, I, have, I, I have always preferred Eloy uh, to the work of his son. His son's good. Uh, I only saw um, Day of the Beast for the first time in the last year. I also reviewed that on this channel. And look for that. Um, so, uh, but anyway, Eloy stuff had this certain quality to it. It's very Spanish, uh, very much the, the, that kind of vein with the kind of naturalistic look, uh, uh, a lot of location shooting and outdoor shooting, uh, and kind of a lot of places uh, of, you know, uh, less than opulent uh, living, um, especially in Cannibal Man. Um, definitely some class commentary, sexual commentary. Eloy is gay, and uh, he 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 put that across uh, in really subversive ways, uh, without being super blatant. But I mean, a thinking person can figure these things out. Um, you would think, one would hope. Um, so uh, I also liked Jorge Grau. Uh, from the same period, uh, and I've reviewed his Hunting Ground on here, uh, and his Living Dead in Manchester more. Uh, Hunting Ground is on a really nice Blu-ray that I reviewed a while back, but that's from the 80s. But Grau did some 70s uh, Jallos that I also liked, um, which I kind of reviewed alongside the D.L.R. Glazy Jallos on Shock Cinema, in Shock Cinema magazine. Um, but... Those growls haven't hit Blu-ray yet, but now like all the Eloy D. Uh, of note are coming out on Blu-ray. So uh, Cannibal Man has a nice deluxe edition, uh, and No Hold the Scream does, uh, amazingly. Uh, no One Heard the Scream, and um, then there's some other of his movies uh, from this later period in the 80s, kind of crime films, uh, kind of more humanistic films, still some exploitation, uh, but but non-genre in an overt way. I mean, some action, yeah, but not not science fiction, not horror, not Jallo, etc. And um, all of those are on on Blu-ray now. Um, basically, everything but the glass ceiling. Um, all of those movies, um, except for Murder in a Blue World, have recently been added recently uh, been added to Shudder, um, and I am going to put you on hold real quick to answer an important question, and I'll be right back. I have returned. That was a very important uh, text I had to answer. Uh, so where were we? So, um, yeah, so uh, a bunch of these D.L.I. Glazier films, uh, with the exception of Murder in the Blue World, are, have recently been added to Shudder. Dot com. So if you have that, then you can check them all out and see what the fuss is about. Um, as far as this one goes, uh, like I said, I saw it a while back, and um, the print wasn't that great. Um, it 
was pan and scanned. I'm, I can't recall if it was, it was cut or uncut. Um, but in any case, like I said, I kind of filed it away as kind of the weakest of, of, of that batch from the early 70s. Um, but, you know, I'm reassessing it now. Um, I think this is an important release. Uh, it's an insane movie. Uh, so let's talk about it. So Su Leon uh, played Lolita in Stanley Kubrick's 1962 Lolita. Uh, plays Anna Vernia. She's a nurse in this um, kind of strange high-rise hospital uh, set in the near future uh technology is more advanced i mean the computers are are huge huge they're not small but you know uh they're they're omnipresent and do everything for everybody so um there's weird abstract sculptures and there's a little bit of odd fashion a little bit odd uh, uh home design you know just it doesn't look super futuristic but it doesn't need to because I mean, if this was 19, uh, 1973, you know, I mean, they probably, this was probably going to be set like 2000. So, I mean, you know, our fashions weren't that much different in 2000. They're not, they're not that much different than the ones in this movie now, um, for most of the characters. Uh, and, um, basically it's kind of like a... There, there's not a lot of uh, detail gone into this world and how it changed from our world into this future world, like how society functions. It's all kind of in the background. Backstory, he probably wrote down notes somewhere uh, in the script, but it's not, um, it's really focusing on just people living under this system. Now, Clockwork Terror was the alternate title uh, and that's because uh, parts of it are uh, riffs on and pastiches of um, A Clockwork Orange. And uh, I wouldn't write the movie off, though, because of that. Um, that's kind of the my point of view and also the point of view of uh, Kimberly Lindbergs, who uh, is a friend of mine. She wrote the uh, booklet inside of this called Reinventing Lolita in a Blue World, uh, which is an excellent um essay and points out a lot of things about the movie that uh, are kind of uh, meta and 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 uh, things that you might not really realize uh, or appreciate you going in if you have that prejudice against it as just being a Kubrick ripoff. There's a lot of Kubrick homage in this movie. Um, it doesn't look like a Kubrick movie, which is fine. I love the way Eloy's movies look, though there are portions where it's obvious he was kind of, you know, filming on a very sterile kind of set with medium shots, you know, very clean looking, which is one of Kubrick's many visual hallmarks. Um, so anyway, Susan Suleon's casting, uh, there are various riffs on Lolita as well. Quite, quite a lot of Kubrick, Kubrickiana in this, that's a word. Um, so Anna, like I said, she's a nurse and she... You know, in the beginning of the film, she wins this award for her incredible compassion with patients. Now, this guy who's kind of courting her, not very successfully, uh, works at this same hospital. His name's Dr. Victor Cinder. Uh, he's played by Jean Sorel, who, who's been in a ton of movies I've talked about here. Um, and he works on the fourth floor, and his domain is basically this place where he is trying to alter the brains of, of aggressive and violent criminals and make them fit into society. So that whole riff of the Ludovico technique and the government changing your, your basic behavior and the moral implications of that uh, are in this movie. Uh, it's, it's not handled the same way as in A Clockwork Orange, and it's not the uh overriding theme or plot point as it is in a clockwork orange but it is an important plot point and it does overlap and dovetail with the main plot point which is kind of jallo s that there's a killer uh going loose in this in this futuristic city has killed a lot of young men and is rumored to be the, a sadistic homosexual 
And I love the way Eloy uh, subverts all of people's stereotypes about gay people uh, with kind of a wink, you know, uh, while he does it. Um, uh, well, that's one way. Um, there's others. And um, so, yeah, this person's killing them. And eventually, Dr. Sender's boss of the clinic, who, of course, thinks this experiment is this awesome you know, step forward for humanity. Probably thinks it'll get a lot of money for the hospital and notoriety and fame. Um, he's probably more concerned about that than the actual, actually helping people. Um, Cinder is kind of on the fence. He seems more into, yeah, again, the scientific breakthrough, the, 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 the glory of it, the significance of it scientifically and how it will help people, you know, all be kind of, homogeneously integrated into society uh, more, you know, he's, he's a total uh, conformist dupe of the system, you know, total dullard. Um, <laughs> by contrast, Anna is more into the human side of uh, nursing and of dealing with patients, and that's why she, obviously she won that lovely award. So uh, she's a very inscrutable character. A uh, fascinating character. Um, Eloy is really good at drawing characters in these movies. He's really good at setting up these premises, uh, especially in these genre movies. These, these, these kind of, uh, you know, they're kind of like these strong riffs, you know, uh, within the genre. Genre he is using in that particular film, like Cannibal Man, horror and and um, gr gruesome horror or a glass ceiling, you know, uh, kind of jallo mystery thrillers. Um, but uh, as his movies go on, you know, he opens things up to kind of the inner lives of, of one or more of his characters. And generally they're really fascinating. And there's usually some really, really insightful dialogue. It's pretty philosophical while also being very humanistic. Um, and, uh, it, it brings across a lot of his socio-political concerns that, that he personally had um, or ones that he wants us to, you know, think about. So, Clockwork Orange is already that kind of movie uh, in a lot of ways, obviously. Um, this one doesn't hit you over the head as hard as Clockwork Orange, nor is it as cinematically advanced as Clockwork Orange. But I think you have to consider the Clockwork Orange element um, as a smaller part of the Kubrick element, which to me is a part of the whole pastiche slash genre slash futuristic uh, hero, anti-hero angle of the movie. Uh, maybe that sounds too involved, but I'll try to explain where I'm coming from. So, um, you know, in no time the viewer uh, is introduced to the, the overt clockwork orange elements which is this, the plot running concurrently with the Anna Vernia nurse plot. Um, and the murders are, you know, talked about in the media and by the doctors as the subplot. Um, so the Clockwork Orange element is you have a, a family, a uh, husband, wife, and kid, and, you know, they're watching this incredible TV, you know, awesome for, for this future world TV set. And, you know, they have this, you know, state-of-the-art deco home and these kind of, you know, relaxing-looking uh, futuristic clothing, kind of, kind of similar to the one the stuff they wore in like Logan's Run or Star Trek: The Motion Picture or uh, Space 1999. Some of those people, these people aren't. I mean, these people are civilians. They, you know, they're not. They're not uh, obviously not in the military or police, like some of those characters. So, but it's the same basic idea. You know, this whole like super laid back. You know, looser clothing. You know, again, it's 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 the seventies and. You know, uh, I guess since society was kind of heading in that direction anyway, then, uh, you know, before Reagan, you know, destroyed all that um, and other factors destroyed it, uh, I guess they figured the future would just be this utopian free for all and everybody would just wear these kind of kind of pajama like clothing all the time, which I had no, no problem with. Uh, there are cultures on Earth who do that. There's not not in the West. So, um Anyway, they're watching TV, and another a little subcurrent of this is the the 
overt like consumer uh the, the manic consumerism of the future society which of course is commenting really on the society of the 1970s of the then present but it's like now it's out of control you know the products are hyped are being more and more ridiculous and mundane and banal and the ads are being more and more uh, kitschy and melodramatic and and uh you know i always like movies with fake tv ads that, especially ones that have kind of some kind of parodic is that a word satirical element uh for instance um putney swope is a great example or baba yaga is another great example um and of course this one is and um so yeah it's got that whole you know ridiculousness of uh, rampant consumerism and how it's uh, permeated every element of society so everybody's trying to be a, a good person and fit in and one way they do it is by consuming these these products you know for their everyday life um and supporting the system that makes them trapped in this consumer mode um so into this little family unit comes barging these four droogs they're not called droogs in this movie but uh they're wearing all black leather and motorcycle helmets uh, that are red with these cool visors and uh you know they look pretty cool and they were all ride a dune buggy together um and obviously their their riffs on alex the large and his his droogs uh dim and georgie and i can't remember the other guy's name um but they're not exact parallels to those four characters uh, by any means there's no real alex the large character uh so you don't actually have someone in this gang uh at least till not until towards the end uh being nominated for this ludovico technique like treatment uh though i guess the analog to alex is this character david played by co-star Chris Mitchum, Robert Mitchum's son. And um, he is kind of being groomed to be that kind of character, you know, who's out of control, juvenile criminal, and they're going to test this thing out on him. But, but that whole arc really takes the entire movie to play out. David is not like Alex. He's, he's not like a constant out of control juvenile delinquent. I mean, he can be when he's with this gang, uh, but he starts to get kind of bored and disillusioned with it uh, after the uh, raid on this family's home where they, one of the members of the gang rapes the wife in one bedroom, one of the gang members rapes the husband in the other bedroom. These are rapes are off camera. And David, Chris Mitchum's character, uh, long, blonde haired, handsome dude who I, ser <laughs> silly, me called uh, Ray Lovelock at first glance when I was uh, doing the last video. I knew it was Chris Mitchum. I was just mixing his look up with the one Ray Lovelock tended to favor uh, in Italian movies of that period. Um, David is, he kind of holds back from this uh, home invasion a bit. Uh, he pets the kid on the head and you're kind of thinking, oh God, now he's going to take the kid to the, the couch and rape him. But no, he he seems to, uh, you know, not want to, to molest or harm the, the boy. He takes out this rage and anger, which, you know, is probably, is probably partially sexually motivated on the home by destroying all their glitzy items, which, you know, is kind of a, a riff on Alex destroying uh, the couple's home that he invades. And, of course, uh, killing the one uh, dancer or whatever with her fabulous sculptures, one of which is very phallic, and I think it just bludgeons her to death with that. Um, so yes, the, the same kind of idea, but it's a you know, very different pacing, just very different vibe to the whole movie. Um, it's not trying to replicate that. It's, it's riffing on some of the ideas uh, on it, uh, giving a similar spin in some ways, but very different in others. And, and the main twist in the movie, which you find out relatively early, and then you find, then you ask yourself, how are they going to deal with this, given this society they live in, and this hospital, and these planned experiments on juvenile delinquents? Uh, 
the main twist is those murders that I mentioned earlier. They're being committed by Anna Vernia, the nurse, played by Sue Leon. So she's kind of, you know, your archetypal, they used to call them like uh, Sister of Mercy or Black Widow or Angel of Death um, kind of nurse. Uh, and that's reflected in some of the alternate titles this movie, by the way, other than Murder in a Blue World uh, and Clockwork Terror uh, uh, and the translation of the real title, Drop of Blood to Die Loving, which I think uh, alludes to the way she kills them, which is surgically smooth with this one needle right through the center of the heart. And yeah, they do die loving because they die generally right after she makes love with them and makes them feel awesome. Um, she's got a hell of a bedside manner. So there were some other alternate titles I'll tell you real quick. One was La Balle de Baudu, uh, which translates as the Voodoo Ball. Maybe I mentioned that earlier. I can't remember. And, and maybe I mentioned Dead Angel and Satan's Brute. I think I did mention them, actually. But just in case, a dead angel came to mind because of that uh, angel of death. Some female serial killers who were nurses in history have been called angels of death or black widows. So black widows also are a, a lot of times the, the, the wife poisoning the husband. Kind of thing. Um, so watching all these true crime videos is is, is teaching me a lot um so anyway as the film goes on we start to see uh, a few scenes of her committing these murders we start to go into it from her point of view there's no like pussyfooting around is it her doing them i mean it's hinted at fairly early and then it's confirmed fairly early too and you take that irony with you when you see the conversations that she has with dr cinder and again it's like He's this, like, you know, I'm going to help this beautiful girl and be her her man. And, you know, it's going to be incredible. And they're sitting with their blue wine. And blue is a predominant color at times in this movie. It's not throughout the whole color scheme. Uh, but the blue world uh, idea comes through in little things like that. And also a lot of the products they show on the television. A lot of the television skits are shot in blue and so it's like blue, I think, me a blue world means like this kind of world that's like a panacea, a placebo, you know, kind of like it's supposed to be perfect and nice and everyone's supposed to be orderly, but underneath this crime is festering and they're going to stamp that out. And the ultimate subversive character um, and uh, actor on the stage of the film is... And Avernia, I mean, she's this compassionate nurse, you know, a, a preserver of life who's this angel of death. Uh, and her motives are, they are pretty inscrutable, but you get these clues throughout the movie. Um, meanwhile, David, um, uh, his big gang turns on him and they all carry whips as their primary uh, weapons. And there's a bit of homoeroticism through, through this. Uh, the, the leader of the gang uh, is a character that I believe raped the husband, and they strongly imply he's gay, and he's got a weird scar on his face. Uh, he's actually David's closest friend in the gang, and they've been friends the longest. And he lets the gang whip David the fuck out of David, and David quits the gang, of course. And then they meet up, and the guy's like, basically, like, the other two guys want to kill you, uh, you know, and... And David's like, that's cool. No, don't worry about it. You know, I'm done. He takes his motorcycle helmet and throws it in a, a nearby fire, which happens to be there, have the cool shot and symbolism uh, that he's done with that. So uh, does this mean he's going to be redeemed? Well, basically, he just kind of skulks around town, you know, just not committing any more crimes. But he just happens upon... Uh, Anna, she's disposing of the body of the first murder victim that you really see a lot of. And this grows out of another scene which kind of deals with the pastiche nature of some of this, uh, some of this storyline. She's at this auction with uh, Dr. Cinder, Mr. John Sorrell. Of course, he looks bored out of his mind. He, the, he's, boring, he's boring as hell, and he's bored as hell. Um, 
Uh, uh, anyway, uh, and the item for auction is uh, a panel of original artwork from Alex Raymond's Flash Gordon comic strip. What's interesting is they cite, you know, the auctioneer cites these facts about the the panel and, and the comic strip itself. He talks about how this art was, was done towards the end of 1932 and the strip debuted January 7th, 1933. And it was from an idea by Joe Connolly and executed by the artist Alex Raymond. So I guess that's an alternate history. Because I don't, I don't know where the name Joe Connolly came from. That gives me the idea that, you know, uh, D. Like Lazy could have just had the dates wrong, slightly wrong. But the fact he has this name out of nowhere, too, makes me think he's just kind of playing with the real information. The real facts are the R was probably done toward the end of 1933, and the strip debuted on January 7th, 1934. So there's a discrepancy of a year. Now, it's not really based on a story by Joe Connolly. I don't know who Joe Connolly's supposed to be. It is based on a, loosely on a novel by Philip Wiley called When Worlds Collide, the basic concept of the world hurtling toward Earth and the three kind of basic character types, uh, Flash Gordon, Dale Arden, and Hans Zarkov, uh, exist in the Wiley novel and are adapted. Beyond that, it's all Alex Raymond. And Alex Raymond did write the strip solely by himself in the beginning and, and did the illustrate all the illustrations. And, and it's some of the finest work in all of comic art, comic books or comic comic strips, whatever. Um, so, you know, it was a particular panel with Hans Zarkov laboring over trying to figure out how to stop this, you know, planet coming towards Earth, which is Mongo, ruled by Ming the Merciless. And, um, uh, Anna, Anna comments to the Dr. Dullard there that, that she's a big Flash Gordon fan. She's, you know, she's going to bid for this piece of art, even though Flash himself is not drawn in the panel. It's just Zarkov. He has no clue what she's talking about. And she finally, uh, she has a competitor, and she finally strongly outbids him uh, and, and gets the item. And then she meets up with the guy. He's this kind of sweet-natured guy work, who walks with, uh, you know, metal um, uh, crutches, and, um, you know, she later hooks up with him. She invites him over, and, and he's obsessed with Flash Gordon, too, and they kind of bond over that a little bit. Uh, so, you know, the science fiction element is still kind of there, hovering in the plot, you know, you know this, this homage, pastiche kind of thing. I mean, there's no plot points that are similar to Flash Gordon. It's just that point that uh, that is so important to her, this futuristic, uh, uh, iconic science fiction work. And here she's in this kind of, you know, fantastic science fiction milieu as a character. Uh, you know, and also it's like showing you more about her character and, and also shows you how she bonds with these victims in different ways. And this guy, they make me love, and, you know, he thinks she's the most incredible thing, and he talks at length about the ways he way he's envisioned his life to play out, and, you know, he's kind of like th this whole, you know, all my life I've thought of this one moment with, you know, in a place like this, with a woman like this, uh, and, and there's a scene similar to that in Superfly. And... and there was a scene in my in my personal life not long ago that was similar to that too, where I said similar things, and I thought it to be the case, and it was briefly, but I wasn't murdered obviously by the angel of death, but I was hurt pretty bad um, and abandoned. But the thing is, she's merciful. You know, she she puts him out of his out of his misery at the moment of his greatest happiness. I should say. She brings him, elevates him to his greatest happiness, his greatest certainty and certitude about being in this kind of strange, emotionally dying world uh, of perfect, too much perfection. And she, she stabs him with the needle through the heart. And she disposes of his body pretty clumsily. But David from the, uh, the Droog gang, he, he espies this. She doesn't notice him, though. 
So he starts uh, following her and stalking her, shadowing her, and he witnesses uh, her next couple of murders, or at least parts of them, uh, in their aftermath. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. Like, one guy she meets at a gay bar, and here Eloy uses a lot of these gay stereotypes of the time. So a lot of it's actual real, you know, real aspects, I think, of, uh, of gay life during that time, you know, you know, where gay people congregate, go to congregate, you know, in their own cult community. Um, and so there's some stereotypical looking, you know, masculine lesbians there and some kind of over the top gay men. But really, there aren't too many like drag queen looking characters or tr cross dressing characters. They're more kind of hippies and dandies, which a lot of hippies and dandies were and are not gay, you know, um, I'd throw myself in there. Um, and look at Johnny Depp, you know. If, if I can mention his name without losing subscribers. Uh, but, yeah, and, and our main, you know, they're guy, like guys that, that would be in mod bands or psychedelic bands, definitely, uh, during that period. Um, and I'm sure there were gay guys in those bands. Uh, but it's like that that's a gay stereotype by the mainstream. That people like my father thought that guys who dress like that, who were in those bands. And my mom thought that too, that they were all gay. You know, like, Queen, they're all gay. And it's like, no, the lead singer, but the rest of the band is, no, they're all gay, you know. Um, <laughs> and I kept, you know, hearing all about this when I got into rock music, about how many of these guys were gay and they were, you know, getting a lot of women. I mean, some of them were getting women and men, and some of them were slowly getting men. Uh, but, but, a lot of the ones I was into were just basically having sex with a lot of female groupies. So it was a stereotype, you know, the long hair to those, that generation denote, and that mindset denoted femininity, hence homosexuality, which again, those aren't, you know, synonymous either. So we've come a long way, baby, with this gender stuff. Um, so she brings one of the, the bohemian, dandy-looking gay young men there and, to her apartment. And again, you have a kind of a, a characterization scene where, you know, he kind of says he goes there because he's lonely, but he doesn't even fit in there. And he said he wonders if it's because maybe he's not who he thinks he is. And you you kind of would think that he went there because, originally because he wasn't who he thought he was or who society thought he was, i.e. heterosexual. But he feels alienated within the gay element, apparently. Now, she, uh, in her work there, uh, now, the auction, she's dressed kind of in regular clothes, you know, civilian clothes, not her nurse outfit. At the gay bar, she's dressed in this incredible black pinstripe suit and a wig, which uh, is very like a, a kind of a Beatles haircut, you know, so androgynous. She looks very androgynous. Still very pretty. Uh, her eyes are incredible, I've got to say. I didn't ever notice really in the lead of the, how, her eyes. Her eyes in this movie are amazing, and they're, they're photographed just almost surreal at times. Surreally at times. Um, so she decides to tell this guy, well, you know, uh, if you want to get with me, you can. You know, I know that's not your thing. And he's like, you know, and then she kind of plays on his notion of maybe I'm not who I, I'm not acting out who I really am. So she kind of hints that, you know, maybe then you want, you're really straight or, you know, she doesn't say it, of course, use the word straight, you know, or, but she, a straight curious. Um, but uh, again, this is all talked kind of about in wonderful emotional depth. And, uh, you know, very well-written stuff. Uh, but they never used the word gay. They never used the word homosexual. Never used the word straight or bi. Um, but, you know what I mean? This, this was for a thinking audience. I, an open-minded liberal think what liberal used to mean. Uh, thinking audience uh, back then. Uh, and, and that's very cool. And I think... I think people of that persuasion, like myself, now are going to appreciate this the most. Um, and maybe people in my age group or older will appreciate this movie more than younger people. It's hard to say. Um, I, I'd love to see younger people's reaction to this movie. Um, 
But anyway, David, while she's having sex with the gay guy, he, you know, breaks into her house and he goes to a big treasure chest she has with her trophies. Uh, the people she's killed, including one of the metal crutches of the Flash Gordon fan, who felt he found paradise in her bed. Um, these are really heavy scenes. You know, they're kind of like these really heavy discussions that the main character of uh, Cannibal Man or Apartment on the 13th Floor, a.k.a. Week of the Assassin, uh, played by Vincent, Vincent Para, uh, his character, uh, you know, he's the killer, and he befriends a young gay man, um, and he starts opening up about himself and speaking in this very existentialist fashion and a lot about his identity and who he is and about being truly himself and about being truly happy. And so there's that whole, you can take it on the surface of being just what I described. He befriends the gay guy and the gay guy identifies with him, even though he has no idea he's violent and when he finds out it's bad. Um, or, you know, you can take it as he's coming out of the closet. You know, I mean, it, it's all an allegory for coming out of the closet, you know, um, and I like the way Bill Iglesia handled it. Uh, the gay man in the movie was, was gentle. He wasn't overly feminine. Uh, he was a little, fem you know, swishy and flamey. And I don't mean those as, you know, I got those terms from my gay friends. I, I didn't know what those meant before that. Uh, but I get it. You know, it's the difference between that and being a feminine guy, though there's crossover. Um, but this character in Cannibal Man, you know, he's low-key gay. He's not, you know, he's not he's not super flaming, and he's not, uh, you know, trying to seduce the Saint Para, Para, who himself, I, I have a feeling, I may be wrong, but I wonder if he being Eloy's uh, alter ego in a few movies was also gay in real life, too. I, I haven't found that out yet for no one. Um, but back to this movie. Uh, so, yeah, you know, after he starts to really open up more about himself after the probably incredible sex with the angel of death. Uh, yeah, she she puts a needle through him. Um, now, one thing she's doing when she's at the gay bar, oh, and David sees this. One thing she's doing when she's at the gay bar, she's reading a copy, a very pop art looking illustrated cover, copy of Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. Um, so when she finds her next victim, she's in disguise as, a, as an old woman. And the victim is a character, a minor character we've already met. Uh, he's kind of this super virile, slightly homoerotic looking uh, acting dude, uh, you know, but he's really like in his mind, like super macho. He's a, he's a, he's an actor. He's a, he, he's a model. He does uh, advertisements for this thing called uh, Panther briefs or Panther underwear. And, you know, they're basically this skin tight, you know, panties for men, you know, loincloths, underwear uh, with Panther prints. Uh, you know, and they're not not too subtle. Uh, and the ad is, you know, him talking about his virility and everything. Um, and they show him during the filming. They show the commercial early in the movie, but they, they cut away and show uh, later in the film, after she has, has killed the young gay man, they show the Panther actor, uh, you know, when they scream cut and the director is trying to uh, tell him exactly how he wants it, you know, spoken and the actor's like cool and you know and in the background there's a big kind of comic strip mural and it shows tarzan swinging to the tree so yet another you know another pulp uh era hero like flash gordon so uh, kind of subverted into this movie um i guess because the first thing you think when you see this guy in the panther underwear is well most people especially probably during that period since he was more ubiquitous in media than is Tarzan. Um, so, you know, again, a, a subtle, not subtle uh, riff on something. Um, these little touches to me add kind of layers to the movie, you know. Um, somewhere around this period, uh, one of the bodies is discovered of the victims, 
and the police, you have no clue what's going on. Like I said, they they roll it over to that hospital uh, to maybe take care of it. Maybe to when they find this killer, take this killer to this hospital and do this Ludovico esque technique on them. So yeah. So that's a little conflict of interest since the killer's working in that hospital and the analysis of um and John Sorrell says during one of the scenes to uh, Anna, you know, he's like, you know, sadistic homosexual maybe is the killer. It could be a woman. Why does it have to be a man? And she's like, yikes, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, she seeks her next prey, and it is the panther guy, uh, the panther underwear guy. And... She's dressed as an old woman. She has a little bit of makeup on and these giant glasses, and they're shaped like hearts. And she's got this gray wig and these very prim, kind of Victorian-looking outfit, which still managed to come off rather bohemian. Um, and when she and she's reading Nabokov's Lolita, and when she first sees him, she looks over the book with the heart-shaped sunglasses, just as she looked over her. Uh, book with the lollipop with the heart-shaped sunglasses at James Mason in Lolita, the Kubrick version. So again, more more homage. Uh, and there's like a lot of time that you see with her. A lot of it's without dialogue. Her living in her house and uh, she's got all her wigs. And her whole house is kind of very eccentric looking. And there's a key scene where she has Dr. Cinder over and they, you know, he's Mr. Sincerity trying to understand, but he really doesn't. They start talking about her parents. And she talks about how her parents were really, like, way out. They don't, again, they don't use the term bohemian uh, exactly, uh, or beatnik, but, I mean, they kind of strongly imply that that was their lifestyle. You know, she describes them as being experimental with drugs, you know, with sex, uh, you know, the arts, uh, certain kinds of music they listened to. And it came down to the way they the way their house looks, you know, it's all very eccentric and, and outside of the norm of society. And of course, Dr. Cinder represents exactly that, the norm of society, which if you don't meet that, he's going to fucking change your brain with, in this case, electro, uh, electric shock uh, things into the brain, uh, not surgery. So um, it's similar to the Ludovica, Ludovica, but not exactly the same. They don't, they don't pin back the eyes or put little things on the head. Basically, they strap the whole head in. And it looks very painful when they show the first uh, criminal being administered it. Um, but anyway, in this, uh, there's a period where David decides to confront her in her house. Uh, and she uh, wears a disguise, even in her own house, to greet him. She, she wears another wig, you know, a black, dark-haired, red-haired wig. And, and dresses as a maid and claims to be the maid of the people who really own the house and gives her name as Isabel. And she kind of plays the, the cat and mouse with David. But David finally is like, you know, I, I know what you are. And she's like, so, what, you know, what do you want? And finally she's like, money. And he's like, well, kind of. I'd like a lot of money, you know, regularly. And then he's like, have a good night, Anna. You know, so she's not thrilled about, about this development. So, uh, I mean, briefly they had made out and he thought something was going to happen between them before he, you know, shows his hand, so to speak. Um, but after this, yeah, she, uh, she, uh, lures in Panther man, uh, the Tarzan cat, uh, as the old lady. And, and when he goes there, you know, he, he gives her this whole big rap about how macho he is and how he loves showing it off in these shows. But then he suddenly becomes vulnerable and talks about how basically I'm just a brainless guy. I'm, you know, peddling a brainless product. You know, I'm just not, there's nothing to me, you know, um, a lot of self-hatred. Uh, and he, he, she says a lot of kind, understanding things to him, of course. And he says, I wish we met under different circumstances. Because he he goes home with her because he sees that her being an older woman, that she's buying him at his services as a studly gigolo. You know, and he's kind of talking about that, too, you know, on the way to their house. You know, sort of bragging about it, but sort of playing it off like, no, I'm better than that. I just do this on the side. And 
But when he gets home, you know, he reveals that he's really a shallow dude who wishes he wasn't. And even down to the point where he he's like, I'm, but he's still shallow in a way because he's like, I wish, you know, you were a different kind of woman talking this way. And she's like, what do you mean? He's like, I don't know, young, blonde, attractive. And so she goes away and takes all her changes out of that guise and, and into how she normally looks, which fits his criteria. Uh, and again, they they make love, and the Panther dude is, he's doomed, man. He gets it through the heart. Um, and David uh, begins collecting the regular payments for Anna. Uh, and he starts buying himself some nice clothes and a really cool motorcycle that's really expensive. It, it looks like it has glitter on it and shit, and... Supposedly it costs like this insane amount of money, like millions. I don't think a motorcycle would cost millions in 1973. Maybe millions of lira. I'm not sure how lira translates to dollars. Uh, but basically they kind of like, they kind of beat his ass. The, the, his gang catches up with him while he's riding uh, his mo this fancy new motorcycle. And they beat the living, you know, fuck out of him. Um, and he ends up in the hospital. Uh, he's badly, badly injured. And guess what hospital he ends up at? And guess who ends up being his nurse? And he's like freaking out. He can't talk yet. He's like so fucked up. And, you know, he feels like, uh-oh, he's totally at the mercy of this woman. He's been blackmailing this literal angel of death right in her element as the angel of death nurse. And she's telling him, you know, don't be afraid of me, David. You know, everything's fine. You know, I'm not going to hurt you. I understand you. And I don't know. Does she? I mean, does she feel a kinship with him because he's been a violent criminal? I mean, she's actually been more of a, mer you know, more lethal than he has, at least what we've shown of his actions on camera versus hers, because we don't really, I don't think, know the final fate of that family. And even if we do, he was an accomplice, but he didn't actually rape or kill any of them. He kind of like, it's like, that's it. I'm done with that after that. Um, so anyway, then he gets recommended for Dr. Cinder's technique on the fourth floor, and she's like, oh, fuck. You know, because she's, she doesn't want him to spill her beans, but he's at her mercy, you know? And so she decides to take advantage of the situation and kill two birds with one stone and lie to the other nurses that she's, uh, she's a nurse on duty taking this new guy up to the fourth floor for Dr. Cinder. But Dr. Cinder doesn't know any of this. And, uh, you know, he actually doesn't even want her involved in this. I mean, you know, and maybe part of it's because he, I don't know, he, he, he already had let her attend one of the sessions, and, but she had already voiced this kind of objection to it. And so there's this whole kind of idea, obviously, here that, well, damn, if they catch me, then I'm going to be put under this treatment and I don't fucking want it, you know. So I got to put this guy who's going to squeal on me uh, under it first. And so she takes him up there, but she doesn't just take him up there and prepare him for it. That's what you think she's going to do, the smart thing to do. Since he can't talk yet anyway, she could just kind of slyly observe while, you know, Dr. Do-Gooder, you know, annihilates his, his, his aggression centers. But she can't help herself. You know, she goes into a little philosophical talk with the mute. Uh, Droog and um, places her needle in the perfect spot. And adjacent to it is this observing one-way mirror where these guys he's been torturing, or, I mean, um, reforming earlier, now they're all dressed in suits and they're having this proper dinner together with intellectual, you know, very socially acceptable conversation with these butlers dressed in these powdered wigs, like something out of, you know, the 18th century uh, this is totally prim proper, which, which really kind of, I think it's kind of like a visual illustration of where some people, including Dr. Sender in this society, want society to go backwards to. You know, like uh, Anna's talking about how her parents were like ahead of the curve, even though they really were, were posers, basically, according to her. They really were shallow and, and, and they, they did die of drug overdoses and um, too much excess. Uh, but not enough, you know, soul behind their love of art and music and rebellion. Um, 
but you kind of get the feeling this is what Dr. Sinner wants people to go back to the Victorian era or earlier, where everybody's like this prim, proper, neutered person. Uh, though, of course, he's got this, you know, asexual, you know, lust for uh, Lolita. And um, <laughs> what a what a what a symbolic character. John plays it really well. I mean, his he's got that kind of classic, you know, brunette, clean shaven good-looking kind of guy look, and it's perfect for this character. Uh, so anyway, he he finds out about Anna moving the patient, and uh, when she comes in, when he comes in, she's already killed him, uh, and she's still there. She hasn't tried to get rid of the body or escape. She's looks like she's almost either taking a nap or just... Like, you know, all the murders out of her, she's, like, spent, like, cathartic or maybe a sexual release. For whatever reason, she doesn't go through with her plan to deceive any further anyone. And so she tells Victor, I, I murdered someone. And she's got, you know, streaks of his blood all over her face and her white outfit. And she looks quite mad. And her blue eyes are really accentuated at this uh, point. And... The camera moves over to our two-way mirror where the, you know, prim proper dinner of the reformed uh, criminals is going, and they snap, and they start stabbing each other to death, and they use all kinds of, like, slow motion and freeze frame to really make it look even more over-the-top and crazy camera angles and fisheye lenses. And that sequence lasts several seconds to where they butchered their butlers and each other, and that's kind of where we end. And uh, it's looking into that kind of fishbowl-like thing where they're being held. And that's kind of what it's like. You know, it's like the fisheye lens. It's... Anyway, Eloy is a master of his craft. He's not showy, uh, but he's precise. Uh, his stuff is believable. It's naturalistic, but it gets very stylish when it needs to. And he rises to the occasion of this kind of ambitious storyline uh you know with a minimum budget and um i don't know i've reevaluated this and i think this is every bit as strong and emotionally resonant uh as his other three that i mentioned from this period that i like so much so i'm hoping someone will now put the glass ceiling on blu-ray and we can examine the whole oeuvre from that period uh as they're meant to be seen and i'm going to start watching navajeros from 1980, a homoerotic gang picture he made uh, that is now on Shudder. And then there's two more on Shudder of his that I plan to watch very soon, too. I may review them. I may not. I'm not sure. But I wanted to get this one done with uh, because this this was, to me, a major release. And I wanted to say that Kimberly Lindbergh's essay was superb. So I want to give her special thanks. Um, and we've talked a little bit since I saw this and read her book. Uh, and we compared ideas. It was very cool. And um, I want to thank channel patrons Shelly Druckery and Drew Dahmer, and especially the inestimable Tim Tolbert for his continued patronage and collaboration. And I appreciate all of you viewers. And drop a like and subscribe. And I'll be back uh, fairly soon.